We are here in courtroom 500 talking with the jurors of the Van Dyke trial who have done and issued issued their verdict. Um, and we're going to be referring you to you by name. So if you could just give us your name before you speak. Number. Thank you. Your number. We're not using your name. Um, who would like to share first just how it was, um, your number, and just how you feel about this verdict? My number is 245. I feel that we gave a good verdict. We looked at all the evidence and we ruled on it accordingly. And how about you, uh, juror number? 252. Um, I thought everything went the way it should have went. What do you mean by that? Never thought they would have a first degree. I didn't think they could get him on first degree. Number 243. And uh, your thoughts about the deliberations and how you came to this verdict? The deliberations were, I think, they couldn't have been better because we listened to each other. We respected what each other said. When somebody was questioning something, we let them ask their questions and we worked with it until people, till we all came to a consensus. And when that consensus was made, we all realized we made the right decision. And uh, how did you go about that? Did you deal with the murder charge first and then the aggravated battery? We started with the murder first. And we had a little problem at first, but we talked about it. What was the problem? We wanted to decide whether we we're going to go first degree or second. So, but we had to break everything down and we talked among each other until we came to the conclusion. Second degree was a mitigating factor that in Mr. Van Dyke's mind, he was doing the right thing. He was, um, he was experiencing a, an extreme threat in his mind. That's how he's experiencing it. And um, he felt like he needed to protect himself. Now, but not official misconduct, why? Because we felt he had the right to carry the weapon and he had the right to use his weapon because he was a police officer. So he had that right. So we had to say not guilty on that if you looked at the case. What about you, what did you, how would you explain that? I'm remembering the sequence, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm a little unclear about the, my memories. I would need to be refreshed, as they say in court. Um, so I'll pass on that. And just to, to go back to, uh, you said you kind of looked at the first degree and second degree murder charges first. Mm -hmm. um, how quickly did you arrive at that? Was that something you had kind of looked at last night? We went over it last night, but we made no decisions last night. Everybody talked about it, and we couldn't come to a decision on last night, so we said we'll start fresh tomorrow. So it was this morning that you came to that, and then you moved on to the other trial? Yes. Uh, it seems the way you're talking that the question was to convict on first or second. Was an acquittal ever on the table? Did anyone come in the room saying, I don't think he's guilty at all? No. Really? That was never no. an option in any of the jurors' minds? No. Sir, you mentioned that um, you believe that he thought the threat was real. Did that play into possibly acquitting him of the charges? No, we realized that as a police officer, a trained officer who'd been uh, doing his work for about 20 years, that he should have realized what the situation was and instead of escalating the situation, should have at least looked at other options. For example, just taking the time to back away or just the patience to wait for other vehicles to get there, a vehicle with a taser specifically, that instead of escalating the situation, he should have de-escalated. Was there any piece of evidence that helped you with that decision? There were a lot of videos shown. How did that play into it? Well, we kept watching the video where it showed that he kept making the steps forward. Was that the animation or the dash cam video? The dash cam. <coughs> we, we watched that more than once, more than three times, really. The dash, and cam. the dash cam. What was the most important 
evidence or witness that you use down here that helped you make your decision? What was the most important or what was the most important in making up your mind? I would say Dr. Arukumar, was that her name? The coroner, the medical examiner. Her. And why? Because she broke down every bullet, what it did, how it went in, which way it went in, how it came out. Or did it come out? There was another pathologist that the defense put on the stand. What did you make of her? Really didn't care for her. I thought she was kind of cocky. She didn't listen. She wanted to over-talk people. And just to the defense's argument in general, that he made the best decision that he could in a difficult time, how are your feelings about the defense's argument? I don't feel it was the best decision. He was a trained professional of 20 years. To me, he should have thought more carefully about the situation. And the time in which that he got out of the car before he started shooting. Sir, did you, sorry, you looked like you had something to say there. No, basically the same thing. It's like he needed to contain the situation, not escalate it. He took the stand himself. What did you make of his, okay, go ahead. I felt he shouldn't have. He messed up. I didn't, his testimony was incredible to me. I felt like he was trying to remember stuff that he said that maybe wasn't true. And he wanted to make sure he didn't trip himself up. So I didn't really feel his testimony was credible. Same, two, right, same. I didn't think he should have testified because he kept going from one question and he would answer this question, then he would go back and then he act like he didn't remember. He only remembered what he wanted to. It felt like it was a rehearsed situation. And I didn't quite trust that. And did, I know you were sequestered and not supposed to watch anything, but did any of you feel, realize this was such a high profile case or how did you feel about being on such a high profile case? I had no idea that it was like this. I knew that we weren't supposed to talk to anyone, but to be escorted out and to police patrol. Well, we appreciate the safety we had with the sheriff. They did a good job protecting us every day. A little more than I expected. But what did you think about being on this high profile case? It was interesting. It'll be something that I'll talk about for a while. Every morning I got on the bus and on the train and I saw hundreds and hundreds of my fellow Chicagoans and I thought, how did I get on this jury? There are all these people and I'm doing this work and nobody knows it. It felt really amazing. It felt like a burden or a privilege? A privilege. I almost threw my jury paper in the garbage though, because I wasn't coming. What do you want to say about jury service? The United States is really the only country that used a jury system. So I felt privileged after I got here. And there was concern by some outside, you probably didn't know because you weren't watching any news, but there was some concern about the jury makeup and the lack of diversity of the jurors. What would any of you say about jury service and whether you felt race and ethnicity played into this case? I don't feel that it did until the end. The statement that was made at the end was wrong to me. The Boy Scout statement. I just didn't feel that was appropriate. And this was Dan Herbert, the defense attorney. I felt that was really inappropriate. We're past all of that. We didn't come here because of race. We came here for right and wrong. That's all. Did you guys consider the impact of what your decision was going to be outside the courtroom? The reaction among the public for an acquittal or a guilty verdict? I do because I work in City Hall. So I just think about when I go back to work, how many people are going to approach me? Because in the newspaper, they told where I work. So everybody already at my job knew that it was me. So. Did you consider the reaction to whatever verdict was rendered? 
I did not consider that I was aware of it. It is like we're here to do this job mm -hmm. with what the law is and what the prosecution and defense says. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was my job, and that's where I kept my focus. What was the tone in the discussions when you, were, when you actually were deliberating? We have spent <laughs> three weeks with each other. We respect each other. We know each other by first name, not number. We're actually a very diverse group, mm -hmm. economically, socially. We're from all parts of Cook County, and we've learned to appreciate each other. And so we cooperated the entire time. And you said you were just focused on this. Was there um, any thoughts beyond this? whether this could have an impact on other cases, relations between communities of color and police. Did those thoughts either go through your heads as individuals or in the discussions? Well, I wasn't in the discussions. I'm an alternate. <laughs> but, your, but your thoughts about how this case could affect relations moving forward, did that come into your mind? Not really. No. This is about justice. This was about justice, and in this case, it was about this instance, and whether or not justice would be done here, and whether or not we would relate with each other in a in a conciliatory, justice-like way. I believe we did both. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And we're going to go to the audio portion only for the jurors who are uh, willing to talk with us. I'm going to do move over here. So we're in bars. But So we're in uh, audio only, and we're just uh, transferring over and explaining to the judge that this is audio only, and that the jurors who didn't want to be on camera are not on camera, but they are patiently waiting to to share their thoughts. Um, so may we proceed? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And again, just a reminder before you answer a question, if you would say your jury number. What made the strongest impression on you from today's testimony and evidence that you saw? What was it that helped you reach your decision? What was the key evidence or testimony? Uh, juror number 253, I think the turning point for me was when he said, oh my God, we're going to have to shoot this guy. And he said, why aren't they shooting him if he's attacking them? I think there was a pause. I think we all wrote down notes on that one, and I think that was kind of a changing point. A lot of you are not in Anyone else want to elaborate on those statements that he, I guess, made to his partner that night? Was there anything else that folks that really stuck out for you and then helped you make your decision? Uh, juror 248. We watched the video many, many, many times, and I, it was stepping forward instead of retreating. I think we all pretty much thought that he could have avoided it if he had retreated and by stepping forward mm -hmm. it was a bit so you watched the video a lot back in the deliberation room or you watched it a lot during the trial i mean both in the deliberation room mm -hmm. we did and, um how are you feeling about the verdict we obviously started with them but we want to hear about how you're feeling about this verdict and whether it was something that was uh, fairly easy to come to or it sounds like there was some discussion how are you feeling about 248, we first took a straw poll. The way we approached it was we did a blind vote just to see where we all were. And the first vote was seven guilty, um, three undecided. We did guilty, not guilty, and undecided. So it was seven guilty, um, two, seven guilty, two not guilty, and three undecided. So we had a baseline for discussion, and then we moved on from there. 
So there were a couple of people at first who were thought leaning towards acquittal. In our first, in yeah, first in our first, vote. yeah, boat, flying boat. Well, We're getting some instruction from the judge about the types of questions we should ask the mm -hmm. jurors. Uh, so maybe we can get back to um, what. Uh, maybe we can get back to um, just during the trial, some of the evidence. You mentioned the video. We asked the other jurors, um, what did you think of Jason Van Dyke, hearing from him in his own words? Number 250, uh, he seemed scared on the stand. Like you, you, you realized, you know, he was taking his future in his own hands and uh, just seemed like, you know, I didn't really need to make this impact to uh, do it, but at the same time, you know, uh, he, he was fumbling around trying to remember things exactly how they were, and and his memories and, and the facts and other evidence uh, didn't line up. Mm -hmm. Two four nine. Um, I think going back to his testimony, it was rehearsed. Um, he had a, a lot of I don't know. Um, not only from what the questions he was being asked at that time, but he couldn't recollect, well, recollect the day um, right after um, when they interviewed him. So I just couldn't see how you could not remember that. Yeah, and 253, sorry. I think what he said in his initial report right after the shooting incident didn't line up with the video, so it seemed like he was just trying to cover himself up after that when he gave his report. And then the truth came out when the video was shown. Juror 241, I agree with Mo, what everyone has been saying so far that it seemed very rehearsed. It seemed kind of like he was finally giving the play after what they've been rehearsing with him for weeks. And personally, even though we're right here, I felt him staring at us, trying to win our sympathy in a way, I guess. And I think we all kind of felt the same way even with that like when we're still sitting here we felt the same way by all looking at each other and writing stuff down at the same time that we just didn't buy it. Go ahead. Chair 240, I also felt it was um, rehearsed. I felt like he took a pause to want to like tear up or cry. I did look down because I'm a mom and I and he has a mom, of course, and I was just like feeling a little bad for him, but I did um, think that it was rehearsed. I'm very interested to know on what the discussion was like for first degree versus second degree. Why was second degree the decision reached? We considered the mitigating factor of how he perceived um, his actions of the imminent and escalating risk and why he took that action. But we did decide that taking the action was unreasonable, but we did consider what he thought um, when he was taking that action. And that's juror 248. And why convict on everything except official misconduct? Tell me, walk me through the, the logic there. It was the knowingly, um, taking that act and we also thought it was consistent with deciding on the second degree because it was he was knowingly um, what was it using his uh, taking an action that he knowingly knew was not within his official capacity or whatever so the, it goes to his state of mind where he believed he was justified that, am I understanding you correctly right a little right. two for one a little of that but we also kind of considered that what was said before that he could legally shoot to kill he could legally use a gun but he just did it in a wrong way so we thought like legally yes he could do this so it wasn't misconduct did anybody feel um, that this or understand how big of a case this was how many people were paying attention to it I was very aware. I think, I think two, we, sorry, just give your, mm -hmm. your number, make sure we know who's listening. 241, I think, um, I mean, I take public transportation, and so I think it's weird 
seeing like what was said before, seeing everyone here thinking, how did I get this out of everyone in the city? Um, having to get out the car into another car on the train because you saw someone reading in the papers and just like it was always on my mind to look around and be observant and just get away from it anywhere. But I think last night too, um, we realized like kind of felt like president in a way of how many cars are following us out. And I think that was a big hit for me, like this is real. <laughs> Two, four, eight. I was very aware of the um, of this case, both locally and nationally, that it was drawing a lot of attention. And I was aware of the case going back to 2014 and was actually aware of the grand jury. And there are a lot of things that I was aware of going into this, but it wasn't brought up in evidence, so I had to discipline myself not to consider that. Mm -hmm. You know, things like I knew there was a reason why some of the officers were no longer officers and were, um, they were testifying under use immunity. Um, did anyone feel um, concerned at all about the reaction um, in this case because there was a tension on it? Can you repeat the question? Repeat the question, repeat the question. Oh, did anyone feel um, any pressure um, in reaching a verdict one way or another because of concern about reaction in the community? Um, and I forgot to ask the other um, the other jurors, but is there anything any of you would like to say to either Jason Van Dyke or the family of Laquan McDonald? Nobody has to answer that one. Come on, move on to a different question. What will you guys remember about this? for a just the profound duty that had been placed upon us I I know I wasn't sleeping for three weeks I was thinking of it constantly but just because of its impact and because every day we walked in and looked at two families you know we we saw Jason Van Dyke's family and we saw Laquan McDonald's family and you I didn't I couldn't walk in here without thinking of that every day what would anyone else say yeah. about this service? Too fa oh, about the service? Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like we're kind of like hostages, but VIPs at the same time. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's going to be weird walking into a room now and not everybody's standing for us. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting. I feel honored in a way that I was selected. Um, and I met really great people. It was really interesting. I, I missed out on work a little bit, but I feel like life carries on. And we, I did my civil duty, and I'm proud of that. The defense put on a lot of evidence about Laquan McDonald's history. I'm curious to see how that factored into your decision, if at all. Two for one. I think the most simple way to say it is, even though you're not an innocent person, you don't deserve to die. You don't deserve something like that. What about the number of shots fired? Did that play into your decision at all? For eight. Um, we did have some discussion at first about um, the shots fired. We first have to ask if we were supposed to consider it in the um, sequence that the medical examiner had listed them or just the, the number of shots fired. And there was some discussion about possibly two of them were justified and the rest weren't, but we ulti ultimately came to the decision that from the first shot on, it wasn't reasonable. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, that concludes our audio. Hey, if you like that video, be sure to subscribe to our ABC7 Chicago YouTube channel.